reconsider, I think this is a great conference, great, great, great. And as great as it is, I feel I want to reconsider my commitment to it and placement therein the program. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's review. Uh, lions, Kilimanjaro, all the classics in the world, uh, rabies, uh, ecology and environmentally friendly, the velveteen rabbit, uh, education, what, what, what can I say? This was not the bill of goods that I was sold. Dennis, you know, Dennis said, hey dad, uh, I'm doing this TEDx thing. I said, okay, well, you know, cool. And he said, you want to speak? I said, okay. And the whole time, he's not even looking up. He's looking at his computer screen, just crashing through another paper, right? So he's like, uh, dad, you want to be in the TEDx thing? Okay, well, tell me about it. Well, it's just a bunch of people sitting around, kind of like a campfire, <laughs> having, making some s'mores, just trading some story. What do you want to, you think you want to be in it? I'm like, okay, yeah, sure, it sounds like fun. This is not the bill of sale I have sold. Disputatious? Where is Paul? Seriously? Disputatious? It's Saturday afternoon, dude. Saturday afternoon. That's not even a Monday word. That's like a Wednesday word. Intellectual ecstasy? What can I do up here? All right, so I got to give it a shot, right? Unpacking the perfect moment of which this is not. <laughs> um, so how do I define perfect moment? I think a perfect moment is one of those moments where everything comes together, right? Um, not connected things begin to come together. Things become seamless, things become fluid. And a couple components I think have to be in place. I think there has to be beauty. I think there has to be connection. And I think there has to be thoughtfulness. But when it happens, it bends time, and then it's captured in time, so we can go back and we can think about it. I myself counted up perfect moments in my life. Um, I have 247 of them, <laughs> give or take 244, which is convenient because I don't have time to talk about 247. I have time to talk about three. So I will tell you three perfect moments. The first one has to do with baseball. Now, um, there are probably some people who don't understand the baseball rules. Those of you who don't, uh, Tim is sitting over here. He hasn't agreed to, but I just saw him nod. If you want to migrate over so he can give you sort of the play-by-play -play of this is why that's important and that's why this happened, feel free to do that. Or get with him after and he'll kind of unpack it for you. So the perfect moment, the first perfect moment happens on a baseball field. The score's tied, last inning, um, no outs. Two runners on base, first and third. Classic setup, right? Next batter steps up. This guy is huge, huge. I'm playing shortstop. My buddy Ronnie's playing third. This guy is a giant. He's big with a capital B. He's already hit a couple of homers and a triple. I mean, give this guy a little green face paint, and you've got the Hulk on your hands. He is big. I mean, he's about. Is about this big. The fourth or fifth grader, that's big. So he steps up, right? And the runners on first and third, big Cheshire cat grins, right? Big Cheshire cat grins. Because they know the game is in the bag. This guy's just going to rock it out to the next county. We're going to be done. So our pitcher tries to catch him a little off guard, throws in a fastball, but Goliath at bat anticipates it and hits it early, connects, and sends a missile over Ronnie's head, heading for, I don't know, forever? <laughs> but Ronnie anticipates this, and this is where time begins to bend, and the perfect moment emerges. Ronnie's anticipated this, so Ronnie's crouched down, and as soon as Goliath hits it, he springs up, but 17, 18 feet in the air, <laughs> reaches up with like a rubber band arm another nine feet and snags, snags this, this line drive out of the air. Snap, one out. As he's um, coming back to planet Earth, his foot touches the third base bag because the guy hadn't tagged up yet. Snap, two outs, takes one step, fires a rope across the diamond over to first base, 
catches that guy who's diving back to the bag, because he hasn't tagged up either, snap, three outs. Triple play. Unbelievable. This is where like the baseball enthusiasts would be like, wow, and applauding. <laughs> like you see there aren't a lot of baseball enthusiasts. Tim? They're coming to you. Alright. My second perfect moment um, does not happen on the baseball field. It happens in a quaint little restaurant in Nashville. Before I start, I have to have a legal disclaimer here. The following vignette photographs are a dramatic reenactment of the actual event. Any resemblance, actual or implied, to persons fictitious or real is purely coincidental. Viewer discretion is not an issue. No food or water was wasted in this event. And then all photos are myself, they belong to me, or the Hamlet photo belongs to NYU Logan. Uh, and the actors you should know, you might recognize a few actors in this. Uh, but the, but the, <laughs> the actors were, uh, were well compensated. Right? So, um, at the time I was director of charter schools for the state of Tennessee, and I was supposed to have this high-powered lunch with the senior execs, and um, their day has taken a left turn, and they're late. And when they get there, they say, ah, sorry, you know, busy, 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 it's gonna have to be a quick lunch, whatever. So I said, no problem, you know, quickly, Sit down, scan the menu, order a couple of fast salads, and bang, they start peppering me with questions. Blah, 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 blah. It's two on one, so I'm double teamed. So the salads arrive, and you know, I'm trying to get a mouthful in. I'm trying so hard to get a mouthful in, but they keep asking me questions. Every time the fork goes up to ask me a question, then it goes back down. So it's like this. Right? It's like I'm weightlifting my fork. Nothing's happening. So that goes on for a couple minutes. Salvation of the bread basket finally arrives. I look across the table. They're both head down, noses into their salads, like a couple of plow horses stuck in their feed bags. And I figure, said, I'm going for it, right? I'm going to make my move on the bread, seize the moment, you know, carpe baguette. I make a dive for it. I go for the first one I can find in my mouth, I rip off a huge Tarzan-sized bite, and now I'm thinking, uh-oh, got this big wad of bread in my mouth, man, I gotta chew this fast, because these guys, there's a question percolating over the other side of the table. So I'm chewing like a demon. Sure enough, I'm five chews in, another question comes floating across the table. So here I am. What do you do? I'm like Hamlet. To chew or not to chew, swallow or not to swallow. What do you do? I give it the three chew and a quick swallow. What I don't, and, answer, and begin to answer my question, what I don't realize is that in the mad chewingness, a little piece of crustiness has adhered itself right here on my lip. And I'm answering, right? I'm still answering. And when I say the word state, time begins to bend, and this perfect moment emerges. Evidently, as far as I can figure out, well, first of all, state has a lot of powerful attributes, right? State of affairs, federation of state, heads of state. What you probably don't know is it also has powerful aerodynamic qualities. <laughs> Because when I say the s of state, it starts to spin like a little helicopter. And when I say the t of the tate, it's enough propulsion to shoot it out. And it goes over this guy's shoulder. And as it does, remember, I'm still answering the question. I'm watching this and I'm thinking two things simultaneously in addition to answering this. I'm thinking, that is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> And, uh-oh, it's coming back. But it doesn't. It hits a downdraft, stalls, drifts back, and lands perfectly on his blue blazered shoulder. Like a little unannounced visitor. Mars rover landing. The amazing thing, right? The amazing thing is that at that time, in addition to all of this, 
At the time this all happens, the projectile goes shooting out like a clay pigeon. At that time, the waiter shows up, and he's got a pitcher of water and a pitcher of iced tea because he's going to refill our glasses. So he's standing at the table, and I see him see this, and we're both tracking it going up, <laughs> stalling, coming back down and landing right on his shoulder. <laughs> and he can't say anything. He's a waiter. Right? And I'm answering, I'm still answering, so he can't say anything, and he can't gesture, he's got these pictures of water. So he's like, oh my gosh, did you just see that? And so he looks at me, and I'm like, I don't know, what do I do here? Answering the whole time. He susses it out, right? He's like, okay, that was the coolest thing too. My job here is done. So he gives me the old nod and a wink. <laughs> Says, it's all right, you got it handled here. He smiles, and we both smile. <laughs> So that's the second story. The third story is going to involve a little crowd participation. This story is a beautiful story. It's an alleged story, but it's beautiful, and, and I like to think that it happened. But for this, you are going to have to take your foot out of one shoe. Thank you. No? Well, I'm not going to steal them. What? I might think about those, but at 11, 11 and a half, what, 12? What are those? Those look good. I like those. There you go. Now just, just, just feel that. See how, see how interesting that feels? Got one shoe all nice and warm, and the other one's like it just fell out of the bed, right? It's all cold. Yeah, you can feel it. It feels a little naked, doesn't it? You're, all, you're already wishing you hadn't done this. You're already wishing for that shoe. You want to sneak over there and grab it, don't you? Sneak it back. But you can't. So here's the story. Gandhi, spiritual soul of India, is getting on a moving train in a very busy train station. And the train's moving, he hops on, and as he does, someone steps on the back of his shoe. And as he steps up on the train and is moving, he loses his shoe. Right here is where, for Gandhi, time begins to bend, and the perfect moment begins to happen. Because, what does he do? He turns around, and immediately, throws his other shoe. And his friend turns to him and says, what did you do that for? And he says, well now, when the person finds my first shoe, he'll have the second, he'll have a pair. Now that's a perfect moment. Perfect moment, right? Thoughtful, connection, beautiful. And when I do the story with me in place of Gandhi, doesn't come out so well. I'm the guy on the train saying, hey, hey, buddy, that's my shoe, my shoe, he's got my shoe, my shoe. Or, okay, you know, maybe, maybe I'm a little older than the fifth grader, right? But, you know, so I'm a little wiser, so, okay, I would have thrown my second shoe. But I wouldn't have thrown it right then like he does. It would have been like a mile or two down the tracks, <laughs> and I would have said, the smart thing to do is to throw my shoe. But now what have I done? Now I've frustrated three people. One guy's going to find one shoe, another guy's going to find one shoe, and I'm standing there barefoot on a moving train. So, what does all this mean? Bringing it back to the perfect moment. What is, who cares? I mean, so those are funny stories. Uh -huh. What's the big deal? I think now that you've heard some of my perfect moments, you can examine your perfect moments. And you can think about aspiring to be in more perfect moments as they arise. You can be more sentient, right? You can see when a perfect moment is happening. You can see the beauty, or you can see the connection, or you can see the thoughtfulness, and you can immerse yourself in that moment. You can see the beauty in the throw. We can see the beauty in the motion. We can see the beauty in the connection. We can see the beauty in a piece of crusty bread. We, we, can bend time we can throw a shoe and we can change the world.